the fine people out there in podcast land. Thank you for including my podcast in your day. I love hearing how people take me along on their drive, their walk, to the gym, even in their barn. And it really is an honor to be part of your day because I know you have lots of choices and you chose this podcast. I have that feeling when I'm looking for shows to watch on streaming, it's like there's so many choices. What do I choose? Anyway, this is episode number 84 of eBay the Right Way, and today's date is October 26th, 2022. Today's guest is Cora from Missouri. She has been selling on eBay since 2013, so a seasoned seller with lots of experience to share. And I just have one quick announcement. Uh, This is for anybody on the email list for the premium library. There was a glitch on Friday, October 21st. The email went out, but it looks like it did not land in email inboxes based on my... uh, statistical report for uh, that particular email. So if you didn't get it, please check your spam and junk folders or just reach out to me and I will send it directly to you. You can reach me at my email Suzanne at SuzanneAWells.com or if you're on Facebook, uh, just send me a message. Okay, so let's get into the chat with Cora. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of eBay the Right Way. Today we have Cora with us. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm great today. Good. And where are you located? I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, I don't think we've had anybody from Kansas City. I'm not sure. I think Allison Haveman was from, is from Missouri, but yeah, seems like I have so many guests from Texas. Yes. (laughs) Spread all over the country, really. Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, I just like to know where people are and, you know, how the business works where you are. So we're going to talk about that. Um, So let's get started with how you found eBay and what motivated you to get started? Okay. Um, I started selling the summer of 2013. And what got me started was the summer before um, my husband was diagnosed with brain cancer. Oh. And uh, I lost the part-time job that I had at my kid's school that basically supplied my spending money. So, um, by that time I was kind of looking for something to supplement our income and, uh, that turned out to be a really good thing. And then I'd heard about selling on eBay before, and I'd had a minor's failed attempt a couple of years before. I don't (laughs) even remember what I tried to sell, but I always loved thrift stores. And so it just seemed like such a perfect fit if I could make it work. So I tried it again and um, it was actually on July the 4th. And I listed three things that morning, just things I had free, uh, had gotten free. And um, that evening we went to watch fireworks with family and stuff. And when I got home from the fireworks, uh, I'm an optimist. So I checked (laughs) <laughs> on my on my desktop because I didn't have a smartphone at the time uh, to see you know had I sold anything and I had sold my first item oh, and yay. I just took it as a sign that hey this could work so um, it, and it just went from there yeah that's anything can sell at any time yes yes and I guess you're almost a ten year veteran now oh, so no. you know that. Sometimes holidays are the busiest shopping days mm-hmm. yes. for people because they're like 
maybe they're somewhere they don't want to be and they're bored and they're on their phone or maybe right. they, they have to work and their their work is dead and so they're on their phone shopping or whatever so um that's surprising to a lot of people that holidays you get a lot of sales sometimes right yeah okay and what was the first item you sold well, it, it was um, these little booklets I got out of a free box at the library. They were little like real thin paper booklets of uh, for kids, little kids to like teach them the alphabet and colors and that kind of thing. And it was, um, I don't know, there were six or seven of them that I lotted together. And I think I sold it for $9.99 with free shipping at the time. And so, you know, I didn't make any money on it probably, but I didn't care because it just proved to myself that, Hey, I can put up a listing that people are going to see and it's going to catch somebody's eye and it can sell. And I thought, okay, that could have just as well been something that, you know, sold for $50 and I made some nice money on. So it was just really encouraging to me that, that, that sold. Yeah. I love that story. And I have a lot of listeners who haven't started yet. Yes. <laughs> they Just email me and they're, you know, it's not that they don't want to start. It's their life is not set up for that yet. Maybe mm-hmm. they've got two more years at their job and then they'll be retired and they want something to transition into. So they're not bored um, or feel lost in life. That's one of the biggest problems with retiring is you lose your sense of purpose. Like, what am I supposed to do all day? Yes. Yes, (laughs) I can relate to that. um, Just hearing you say that it wasn't so much the sale itself, but just that this process works. Right. It works for a $10 item. It can work for a $100 item, which you have plenty of those. Yes. And it was very nerve wracking to list those first couple of items that day. But I just thought this is low risk. It didn't cost me anything. And really the listing process, going through it the very first time, it wasn't really that difficult. And I mean, if you just look at a couple of listings that have sold on eBay and kind of read through them that are similar to the item you're trying to sell, you have kind of a tutor right there. Yeah. And it it really, it's not that hard. You just jump in and do it. Well, it's just like anything else in life. If that person over there can do it, you can do it. Sure. Right. Most, most of the time, you know, yes. unless it's yes. like being a concert pianist or something, but right. <laughs> like, right. It's, it's really not hard. eBay yeah. has made it easy for just regular people to mm-hmm. sell on their platform. And if you're new and you haven't started, just get started with Suzanne always says stuff around your house. So it doesn't cost you anything. It's not hard. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, that that's good to hear. So um, did you decide at that point, oh, okay, I want to make this a business. I'm going to well, do this all the time. I, I at least thought, hey, I could, I could do this and I'm going to start doing this more and, and hope it can turn into a business. And um, I just, I, I prayed, I asked the Lord to partner with me. I said, I said, if, if this is something you're going to bless, help me. And if it's not for me, you say so, and I'll quit. And mm-hmm. that was just my attitude. And when I go out to thrift stores, you know, I'm looking and I'm asking for help to find the right things and the good things. And I've just had nothing but a blessing on my business. And it's it's just become a wonderful part-time business. I love to hear that because um, when I'm out looking, I'm like, okay, thrifting angels. <laughs> point me to the right stuff. And a lot of times I find things on the floor. Oh yes. Like that was put there for me to pick up, you know, I feel like, um, or where should I go today? Yeah. And just kind of, you know, surrender yourself over to, to like the positive vibes of like, help me with this. And it is attitude, you know, um, the people who succeed, they just can't wait to get out there and find stuff. They know there are items waiting for them to find. Yes. And the ones that don't do so well, you know, they're the naysayers or they have a influential person in their life. that's like, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. That was my ex-husband. Everything, every single idea I have had Mm -hmm. at the time 
was like, yeah, that won't work because, yes. and, you know, it just, you have to have positive energy around you and the people in your home or in your life at least need to be on board with, oh, that's not something I would do, but that's very interesting. And you do very well with that, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of attitude. Cause right. um, a lot of people just don't believe this can work. And, and it works beautifully. And so often when I'm out and looking for things, I'll be looking for some of the things that I normally look for and maybe I'm not finding anything, but then I'll just turn my head and my eye falls on something that might not even be in the right place in the store because someone has laid it down mm -hmm. or it's just an odd thing that doesn't necessarily fit in any particular place. So the person I think stocking shelves just said, well, I'll just put it here. And I, it's just right there. And I pick it up and sometimes the best sales are things where I don't even know what it is, but it's like, hmm, what's that thing? And I'll pick it up and I'll, you know, there's usually a clue on it, a brand name or a model number or something where you can find out what it is. And lo and behold, you know, this it's a golden item as far as an eBay seller goes. And, and it's, that's how I find some of the best things that I found. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of that customers picking things up, changing their mind. They just stick it somewhere. Oh yeah. And I look for that kind of stuff. Like it's just easier to see it because it's out of place. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like the $1,000 autograph book laying in the basket with the mittens and the scarves. Yeah. Like that wasn't supposed to be there, but yet it was sitting right on top for me when I came by. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So what kinds of things do you specialize in? Um, I don't specialize in anything. I sell a wide variety of things. And I always say, if I can sell it with a clear conscience and make a profit, then I'll sell it. So I sell just a wide variety of things. I sell um, like bags and backpacks and tote bags. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I love to sell. I love to sell all different kinds of craft items, you know, the cross stitch kits and needlework and all of that. Um, I also really love um, like sewing machine attachments. Those are, I don't find them too often, but when I do, they're usually a really good profit, usually like a, an embroidery attachment that would go on a machine, that kind of thing, embroidery hoop things that attach to a sewing machine or sewing machine feet, uh, especially vintage ones that, you know, are hard to find. Um, those kind of things can sell for really good profit. And um, I love finding those. Um, I sell. Are you a uh, experienced seamstress? So do no. you know those items? No, 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 no. Okay. But I am really good at research, and um, I I think that's an asset in eBay because you don't have to know what something is or does or how to use it uh, to list it. If you can find out enough about it and make sure it works. If it's electronic, you know, then you can list it. You don't have to know everything about it. Um, mm -hmm. So, no, I'm not a seamstress at all. But um, I also sell a lot of the Franklin Covey planners. Um, yeah, those are great. Those. And those, I hardly ever find one where the rings don't work well. And I always test those because if they don't open and click really good and, you know, with a good solid click, then you don't want those. Um, a lot of times I find ones that look kind of dirty and dusty because they just haven't been used. But a lot of that inside dust is just like paper dust. It cleans right up. Mm -hmm. And I always treat the leather if it's a leather thing. And um, even not in perfect condition, they will sell well. You just disclose whatever flaws they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, those have been some really good profitable items. And I love finding I think, those. Um, a lot of outdoor people and professions use those. Yes. Instead of a uh, smartphone. I personally don't like everything on my phone. Right. <laughs> I'm a paper person. Sure. So, you know, if a real estate agent or a landscaper or something um, that's uh, outside where, um, or they can't put everything on their phone. Like right. if they're a surveyor or somebody like that, that, um, you know, you have to keep up with documents and, and all that, that you just, everything can't be on your phone. Right. So, 
Right. Um, people think, oh, why would anybody want that? You know, carry around your papers. But sure. In some in some professions, it's necessary. And those things are expensive. New. They are very expensive. And the thrift stores around me will have them for a dollar or three dollars. Typically, I, they just have not clued into what they sell for on eBay, I guess. But um, I find that the ones that have uh, slots for cards, like business cards or credit cards or whatever, seem that seems to be an asset. So I always mention how many of those, how many slots for cards are in the listing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think a lot of people like to carry them kind of like instead of a wallet, maybe. <laughs> yeah, those leather planners, um, they're usually overlooked too. Yes. If you look at other people shopping that aisle at the thrift store, um, you know, they're everybody's picking up different stuff. Yes. Usually they'll be left there and our goodwill, well, the ones in Atlanta, I'm not in Atlanta anymore. Right. <laughs> but, um, they would put a date on the tag. So you could see how long it's been there. Oh, interesting. Some of those, I find things all the time that have been through the whole cycle of being half price and everything. And they're still there six weeks later. So it's it's what you know and what you want to work with. Yes. I seem to find them in uh, bunches. Like I I won't find one for a while. And then all of a sudden I'll find three in the same store in one day. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that happens, but I'm glad to take them all. Yeah. So listeners, if that's not something you're paying attention to, they're great because easy to ship. I mean, it's a notebook. It was made to be thrown around and um, they don't expire. (laughs) Right. They're pretty easy to store. Yes. Um, And even the the faux leather ones will sell very well. mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, What else do you look for? Um. I like to sell medical items, things that, of course, don't need a prescription, but um, things like wheelchair pads for the seat. I've sold those. I've sold um, some of the CPAP supplies that, you know, are just the kind of refill things like the little cushion for the mask, not the mask itself, things like that. Um, So let me interject about the CPAP supplies. There are some very specific rules on eBay about what you can and cannot sell as far as CPAP. Do you, do you know enough about that to inform the listeners of what is and isn't allowed? Uh, I don't know the entire list because I've just looked up certain items that I've come across to check on. I know just the little silicone uh, cushions are okay to sell. Um, I find the masks sometimes, but those are a no-no because those require prescription. Right. And um, I don't know that I've really come across other things. Although the other day I did find uh, a little machine that you put the mask into to clean, to clean it. Okay. And I believe that's okay to sell. Um, I don't have it listed yet. Um, But other than that, I, I don't know. Well, I know another seller, I've known her, gosh, maybe 10 years, and I think she was a uh, nurse and worked in respiratory therapy, Right. and she came up with the idea of making these covers um, for the tube part and for the face mask part, Um, and she sells them as an accessory, and so it's not, it's, it's just to make it look better, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought that was very creative. Yeah. Somebody in the field that knows what people would want. And she's talented enough to sew and make these things. So, um, and she does very well with that business. So uh, that just goes to show you that if you think creatively, there's all kinds of products that don't even exist yet that you could make, and then it's just wonderful to have multiples of things to sell because you do the listing one time and then you just keep selling the same thing over and over. So uh, that's like the lazy way, but not really because you have to figure out how to be unique and how to have something that no one else has. (laughs) So anyway, enough about CPAP. Good for her. Yeah. Um, I also like to sell health and beauty items. 
sealed is my preference, you know, for things. And of course, things that you can check a date on and make sure it's not expired. Um, beauty creams and all the anti-aging kind of things. A lot of those will sell really well mm -hmm. and some perfumes and that sort of thing. Um, I also find that some of the hair removal products uh, can sell very, very well. Um, the like laser hair removal things, those mm -hmm. don't require a prescription. You can just buy those. And I run across those uh, with some regularity, I think. I think people must buy them and try them and it didn't work for them or they didn't want to stick with it long enough. And so they, it ends up at the thrift store. And most of the time, they don't price it up anywhere near where it costs retail. You know, they'll, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure they know what it is. So usually those are pretty affordable, at least around here. And even the samples like Clinique and Lancome and all those where you get the bonus gift. Yes. People just donate those and the little sample size things, trial size. I'm shocked at how much some of those sell for because yes. those anti-aging serums and all that are very expensive. Right. Yeah, sometimes around here, the thrift stores will lot up like little hotel sizes of some of the, the nicer soaps like Crabtree and Evelyn or something like mm -hmm. that. And you can get a bag of the sample size or the hotel size of soaps for $2.99 or $3.99. But you can turn around and sell those to somebody for a nice little profit. And, uh, you know, they, they just don't realize what some things are worth. And that's, of course, what we love to find. Yeah, and they can't know everything. Right. And back to the hotel toiletries, a lot of hotels are going to the large dispensers now mm -hmm. where you yes. don't get all those individual things. And people use those for all sorts of reasons. I know at some of the festivals like um, Coachella and what's that one in the desert? Oh, Burning Man, all that stuff. Um, they they bring those out there and they trade with each other and, you know, give them oh. to other people. And um, like, that's a whole thing. It's a whole underground, uh, <laughs> I guess, currency. I don't know. Yes. Uh, that's what people told me when they bought them from me. Cause I was like, Hey, are you, are you using these for travel? Cause like, I want to know what, what's going on with these things. And one person said that she was involved in prison missions Yes. So they would take these things into the prisons and give them out. Um, Cause like, I guess the soap in prison's pretty bad. <laughs> Probably doesn't smell pretty. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just, you know, different things that, or I'm going on a trip to Alaska and I'm bringing all this stuff with me and, you know, out in the wilderness, you can't carry a whole bunch of stuff. You, every ounce matters in that backpack. So right. anyway, just um, it's not just about, the hotel soap it's the size of it and the scent and the brand and I've sold Crabtree and Evelyn little maybe four piece sets for $30 and it's right. just soap and shower gel and it doesn't look special it's just that it's packaged small yes that that's a, a favorite brand to find definitely because um everyone I've ever had has sold and sold for a good price mm-hmm well, and some of their stuff is retired, just like Bath and Body Works. Sure. Where you might stumble on something that nobody has. I found those kinds of things and sold lotions and stuff for over $50. Yes. So you just have to, you have to have that in your mind all the time. Oh, is this retired? Is this discontinued? Yeah, it's just shower gel, but, you know. <laughs> it's, a, it's unbelievable what some people will pay for shower gel. And I think maybe it has to do with being a gift. Like, oh, this was my mom's favorite and they don't make it anymore. And, right. Oh, here it is. And I'm going to give it to her for Christmas or sure. whatever. It may not be for the person buying it. They just found something unique that's going to make somebody else happy, <laughs> which we love. <laughs> well, sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what else? Do you have any other look for items? Uh, yes. Um, plush, of course. I love finding plush. And um, it's really hit or miss. You have to be willing to dig through it all and uh, check individual things. And I look for things that look unusual because, you know, 
regular teddy bears and, and rabbits and things seem to be a dime a dozen. But when I find something unusual, or especially if it looks like some character that, you know, I'm probably not familiar with, but again, I can research it and find out who is this character and look it up on eBay and see if it's something that sells, um, then, you know, sometimes you get a nice surprise and you get this 99 cent plush thing that's going to sell for 30, 40, $50 or more. And so I'm, I'm always looking at plush. And uh, of course, I love that, you know, it's so easy to pack and ship, it's not going to break. And um, I just make sure it's nice and clean. And I find that even if it's a little bit dirty, it, there's something about the fabric, well, it's not fabric, but the material that it's made out of, it kind of resists stains and it's pretty easy to clean and freshen mm -hmm. up. I just make sure it doesn't smell like cigarette smoke because I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Um, but if it's um, just, you know, sometimes it looks like a kid maybe splattered a, a little chocolate milk or something on there, something that's going to clean up real easily, um, then I'll get it. And it's, it's amazing how very little cleaning will just brighten it right up. And But most of the ones I find are perfectly clean and you know nice and um so that's really a plus because I don't like to deal with really dirty things but other than that um kitchen items all kinds of different things that you would use in the kitchen um particularly I like to find some of the electronic things like juicers mm -hmm. if there are um the really heavy weight ones that are you know made out of steel that are real heavy weight like I sold a, a one made by Acme not too long ago and um, I usually pick them up and if, if it's super heavy then I know it's one of those really good like made for commercial usage uh, kind of a juicer so those will sell really well yeah um, I have a Jack LaLanne yes let's see I think I got it like 15 years ago and then I kind of didn't use it for a while. So I sold it. And then I got on this help thing a few years ago. And, um, you know, I'll do a, a green juice or something. It's sure. just nice to be able to do it. So I bought right. it again, um, like <laughs> off Facebook Marketplace. And <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, it's one of those things that maybe you don't use it every day because they are a pain to clean. But um, yeah, mine's an older model. And if, if you just need to buy a new strainer basket or the little uh, tightening tool, um, you know, those parts, they sell because oh, yes. people um, like these kitchen appliances that last and they're durable. And it's right. so much more economical to just go on eBay and buy um, a part if it needs to be replaced then buy a whole new juicer because if your juicer is 15 years old, uh, there's probably no parts for you right. on the retail site. You're going to have to figure it out on eBay and buy something used. Right. So though, yeah, those kind of things are great. I like to buy things even that I can just part out. If it's something that um, maybe all the parts aren't there, mm -hmm. but I've got enough of the parts at a really low price that I can part it out. I'm happy to do that. I found um a salad master uh one of those uh food processor things mm -hmm. um I don't know a month or so ago and it just had the hand crank part and the cones the cones that are the blades and it didn't have this the base of it mm -hmm. and I looked on eBay and several people had sold just the parts that I had so I went ahead and got it. Whereas if I had had the base as well, the whole thing together would have sold for, you know, much more money, but you can only sell what you have. So you have to right. decide, okay, am I going to get this and part it out? Or is this something I'm just going to skip and leave in the store? So I got it and it hasn't sold yet, but just not much longer. And um, in fact, I just posted it on the hundred dollar sale thing for October I found an entire salad master food processor food processor set um, and it's apparently a particular version of that it, it's the v it's salad master v um, and I don't really know what the difference is because I can't tell much difference just looking at them but it um, I 
think I want, I want to say I paid nine fifty for it and sold it for two forty plus shipping. Wow. And that's it sold fantastic. Just with, yes. It sold just within a few days and it was in excellent condition. And, um, so I asked a high price for it, even though more commonly, it seems like they sell for around 115 or something like that. But I thought others have sold for this high. And I thought there's no reason not to ask for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. So I did. And I thought I may have to wait a little bit because there were, there were plenty for sale less than mine that really were the same thing. But I thought it has sold for this much before it'll sell for this much again. And I was surprised I didn't have to wait very long at all. So that was a great sale. Yeah, that is great. And the thing about Salad Master is, uh, for the listeners, it's not electric. It's a hand right. crank kitchen uh, grater, shredder. You can do all kinds of things with those cones. And that kind of stuff's making a comeback because mm -hmm. of, um, you know, doomsday preppers where you don't need electricity or just, um, you know, things are uncertain. You never know when you're going to not have electricity and you need to be able to prepare food. Um, that's a great thing to have on hand. And um, just really with the past two years since COVID and all the weird things that have happened, people are conscious of that. You know, what, what happens if, the power goes out for an extended period of time, you know, do I have the right tools on hand to, um, you know, carry on? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, and they're so well made mm -hmm. that um, that's in your favor as well, because even used it, it's in great condition. So, I mean, it's stainless steel. Yes. There's not a whole lot can happen right. to it unless you run over it with your car or something. Right. <laughs> right. It, it's heavy, it's well made, very much so. Yeah, heavy that's a great yeah. sale. Yeah, I loved that. Um, I also look for some other electronics. Um, we'd mentioned the juicer things, but um, like the new wave um, cooktops that are induction cooktops. Okay. Um, I find those sometimes. And I only one time found one that was in really bad condition. The top was really scratched up really bad. And I thought, I just don't think I want to even sell that because I don't like to have to qualify, you know, all those flaws. Um, but usually when I find them, maybe they're a little dirty. They got something spilled on top and it cleans right off and, you know, just make sure it works. And um, seems like the thrift stores don't usually price those very high. I don't know if they don't know what it is or think nobody wants it, but um, they're very expensive to buy new. So if you can get one at the thrift store and sell it, you know, for a nice profit, it, it's it's great deal for the buyer and it's a great sale for the seller. So I love those. I also, um, I have one thrift store where I kind of regularly find these um, pet safe wireless fence transmitters mm -hmm. and it's a black plastic kind of a boxy looking thing about 10 or 12 inches high and about 10 or 10 or 11 inches wide and it, it transmit the signal for a electric fence and you can find those and even if you don't have the ac cord with it people will buy those because they want either a replacement or an extra one and the thrift stores usually have those at three or five dollars and they'll sell for around 50 okay. um, shipping. So those are great finds to find. Um, Is that something you have to know if it works? Uh, yes and no. Um, if you have the AC cord, you can check it and just see if it powers on. And if it powers on, it probably works. So I would just put in the listing, you know, that um, it powers on. And um, if I don't have the AC cord, then I just say, you know, this is untested because I don't have the cord and it has not seemed to be a detriment because I think it's one of those things that's well made enough, even though it's plastic, that um, they almost always work. And of course, if it doesn't work, you know, I'm going to accept a refund on it mm -hmm. and a return and I'm going to be paying the, the price to have it returned. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I have even put that in the listing, you know, say if this doesn't work, you can return it and I'll pay the return shipping. 
Okay. Um, I, I have done that. So on, well, and on other things where it's like, okay, I can't test this, but I want to give my buyer some incentive to, to buy it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it will probably work, but I can't guarantee it. So I want them to feel like, okay, if it doesn't work, I'm not out my money. I could return it and get a full refund. And so why would you want it back if they say it doesn't work? Why wouldn't you just refund them? Um, well, true. That's true. Yes. And I, I think I have updated my, my uh, listings to say that that's true because I, I did realize after a time or two that doing that, but I, but I do like to make sure that they know if this doesn't work, I want them to see my wording in the listing right. yeah. that says, Hey, if this doesn't work, since I can't test it, I'll refund it for you. It's not a problem. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And yeah. I'm sure listeners are like, oh, but anybody could say it doesn't work. Well, you just have to trust that you're not going to get a lot of those kind of people. Because Right. And yeah, some- that, that happened to me again last month. Somebody said something was broken or it was, there was a problem and they sent a picture. And it was clearly not what I shipped to them. It was something oh. else. So either they were confused which there's a lot of that going on yes. and, or they just know the eBay guarantee and they are going to manipulate sellers to, you know, their advantage. But um, I think it goes back to your attitude. It's like, most people are honest. Most people are good. Right. You approach this business with somebody's going to scam me. What if this happens? What if they're lying? What, you know, and, and, in this victim mentality, that's what you're going to get. Right. So if you just assume that people are like you and they're going to be honest, then you'll be okay. Sure. And I try to go a step ahead and assure the buyer um, that they're not being scammed or something, because I'll, I'll say in our communications back and forth, I'll tell them, you know, if, if, um, if I make you a promise and I don't keep it, you can call eBay customer service they can go back and read the messages that we Mm -hmm. have exchanged. And if they see that I, as a seller, am not holding up my word to you, I said, they can close my account. They can shut me down if if they see that I've, you know, violated their policies. So I said, that's, you know, a guarantee to you that you have a recourse here. And um, I think people like to know that, it's not just the seller's word sometimes, but eBay is going to stand on their side if something happens. Well, and I think that's the reason both buyers and sellers come to eBay and other selling platforms. Um, I mentioned this somewhere along the line, but uh, a lot of people are like, oh, I could just open my own website and sell this stuff. And I don't want to pay eBay fees. They're too high. And I'll, you know, I'll suggest promoted listings to my students. Oh no, I'm not doing that. I already pay enough money. And it's, it's like, no, um, first of all, if you have your own website, how are you going to get people there? And how are you going to get them to trust you? Because you're just some stranger on the internet by yourself trying to sell stuff. When you're on eBay, you have that third party involvement to solve problems and to make sure everything is fair. Yes. So, um, I think people overlook that. I was just going to say, you're never going to have the traffic that you're going to get from eBay. And it's not just the United States, it's international. Mm-hmm. And you could never generate, you know, the lookers that you're going to get from the whole eBay community of uh, potential buyers. So I think that's a big advantage. Well, and it would be just like having a garage sale because yeah. it's whoever shows up and you don't, you don't have access to it's like this whole world of people congregated, ready to buy. That is one of the greatest benefits of eBay is people go there to buy stuff. They don't randomly end up there like if they're driving around on a Saturday and they see a garage sale. Like this is, you know, it's a process that works. And here's what I was going to say. Um, do you use promoted listings? No, I used to. And I didn't really see a huge advantage in it. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like I was losing a little bit of my profit. Mm-hmm. So I, I ended that, I had it on all my listings and I took it off all of them and I didn't really notice a difference in sales. So I mm-hmm. have just left it off. 
Okay. Well, the point I was going to make about that is yes, sellers do complain that, oh, that's just more money for eBay. But if you haven't tried it, it's great to do an experiment to see, like you said, you tried it and didn't see a difference. But um, even if you did it at 10%, the increase in sales is going to more than justify what you're paying on that promoted listing. So it's an individual thing. Like sellers need to try it, look at the numbers. Okay, so this month, $50 on promoted listings. And there's no way to know if those items would have sold without it. Right. I mean, that's the the big unknown, but um I just, it bothers me when I see sellers saying, oh, it's already too expensive. No, you can't have that attitude. It's like, wow, what a blessing to have this place to sell our stuff. Yes. Where we have this third party involvement, where if things go wrong, we can get help. Um, A lot of times scammy things happen. And if you talk to eBay for business on Facebook, Uh, They'll get things reversed, get those negatives taken off, um, you know, whatever. So you don't have that by yourself. But um, I look at it as I am happy to pay those fees for access to all these buyers and to be able to have the life that I have, uh, freedom, you know, like today's Wednesday and I'm not working this afternoon. I'm going to go have lunch with a friend and do what I want to do. And yes, I can't do that at a regular job. <laughs> oh yes. I, I love the flexibility of selling on eBay. And I always like to tell people I'm the best boss I've ever had mm-hmm. because I can take a day off when I need to. Like yesterday, I had the whole day off. Um, in fact, I would have to remember to take my store off vacation when we, when we're done. And uh, I just was too busy yesterday to worry about eBay. And, you know, I didn't have to call in sick when I, you know, wasn't, And it wasn't any trouble at all to have the day off. So I love that flexibility. And I love, I can work at seven in the morning or 11 at night, whatever I feel like that day. And that's, that's been one of the most beautiful things about eBay is just the flexibility and it's all under your control. Mm -hmm. What was your professional life before eBay? Oh, well, um, directly before eBay, I, I've been a stay-at-home mom for a long time. And um, I used to work as a travel agent before I had my kids. And before that, um, I worked uh, for a small television station mm-hmm. um, right out of college. So I've done several different things. And, uh, but now I'm, I, I don't know, people ask me if I'm retired and I'm like, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that because I kind of went from being a stay-at-home mom and part-time eBay seller to just my kids are, you know, more grown. I have one in college, one just out of college and uh, still doing eBay because I just love it. But I'm not really retired, but I don't really like have a regular job either. So I'm like this free spirit who makes money on the side. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> I, I just do it because mainly it's fun, but also it's profitable and, and mm-hmm. it's, it's great to have that extra money. What is your degree in? Um, I have a degree in psychology and then I have a master's in, they called it radio TV film at the time. They might call it mass communications now. I don't know. Oh, so those two things work well with working with customers. They do. Yeah. The and the psychology and- part of like, hmm. Why are they mad at me? They probably had a bad day. It has nothing to do with me. (laughs) Right. Well, it does help you turn things around in a dispute and say, okay, how's the customer feeling? Mm -hmm. And, you you know, you want to address their concerns. Are they feeling like they're cheated or this thing isn't working right? And what can I do to make it right? And, um, you know, nobody likes to refund something, but I think, okay, if I was the buyer and I got this and it didn't work, what would I want the seller to do for me? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd want a full refund and, you know, it hurts a little bit sometimes to do that as a seller, but it's like, it's the right thing to do. So just do it. And, you know, it's not going to cause me to not be able to, you know, buy groceries or whatever, you know, it's just a little bump in the road and it's part of doing business. So you just refund it and get on with your life and it's not a big deal. And there's always more sales coming. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I say. Yes. Um, 
And it seems like the lower dollar items are the ones that come with problems. Like I auctioned off a bunch of stuff starting at $10 and a couple of those people got the items and had an issue. And I'm like, you know, I'm just refunding them. Um, yes. You know, it's $10. I yes. paid $2 for it, whatever. Um, not a big deal. So yeah, you just have to have your mindset as that's just part of doing business. I'm going to get another sale. Who knows in five minutes, in five hours, whatever. And you just keep going. That's usually exactly what happens. And it's like, Oh, okay. That just made up for the money. I just refunded. So I'm, it's no big deal. Right. Yeah. Well, you definitely have the right attitude. So what were some of your biggest sales? Um, let's see. I made a few notes so I could mention some of those. Well, you get um, an award for being so very prepared. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> to be. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one story is um, I was in Savers one day and I kind of rounded a corner where they have some kind of oddball things sitting that are big and bulky. And I saw one of those really big um, blow molds that was a green space alien. And it lights up on the inside. It's about three feet tall. And my eBay radar just went off. And I thought that's an oddball thing. And so uh, I went over and grabbed it. It was $15 and I put it in my cart. And then I looked it up on eBay because I thought I want that thing in my cart just in case. So I looked it up and I was blown away. Some of them were selling for over $200. So I thought, okay, I have struck gold here. So I took it home, cleaned it up. It was really dusty, probably been sitting in somebody's garage. The light worked beautifully. It was kind of a bear to to photograph, but I got it listed and it sold in less than two weeks for 225 plus shipping. And that was a great sale. And my kids, when I brought that home, they thought I was insane, but I told them what it would sell for. And, you know, until it sold, they were kind of rolling their eyes and stuff, but then it sold. And then they, they were impressed with me. So then <laughs> about three weeks later, the three of us were in Savers just shopping. And um, my son nudges me and he says, hey, mom, there goes another one of those alien things. And I look up and an employee is just carrying it onto the sales floor. So I literally dropped what I was doing and I ran over to the guy and I said, uh, excuse me, are you putting that out for sale? And he said, yes. And I said, could I have it? And he said, sure. And he looks at me like I'm crazy. And I take it and I run back to my son. I'm just giddy like a fool. And I don't, <laughs> I don't care who sees me looking like a moron laughing over this thing. And I kissed it right in front of my son because I knew what it was worth. And it was priced at $8. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I can't wait to get this home and list it because I knew what it would sell for. And again, it sold in less than two weeks for $225 again. Ah. And I'm, I, so every time I round that particular corner at Savers, I'm like, please let there be another one of those sitting there. And I haven't found another one, but um that was a really, that was really fun because I didn't just find the one I found two. Um, That's crazy. I wonder if they came from the same person. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm, weird. I'm forever looking for those again, because they're, they're just, I love things that are just so silly like that, that, you know, who would, I've never seen one of those before. Um, but I hope to see some more because those, those are great. Um, and then I had um, at one of my favorite little thrift stores uh in the kitchen section um they have like these rows of shelves and and on this one bottom shelf I saw this item and I didn't really know what it was and I walked past it and I probably I go to that store sometimes several times a week um because I always find stuff there sometimes you know every day I'll find something interesting and I'd walked by it probably three times that I had been there and on, on this particular day, I thought, I wonder what that silly thing is. I don't even know what it is. So I bent down, I picked it up. 
um, I had to look up what it was. And what it was is a, it's a, a two or three piece plastic thing. And it, it just looks like a tray with these grooves in it. And then a top that goes over it with grooves. And what it is, it's a cake ball roller. And you put your dough in there and you manipulate the top kind of like this. Oh, okay. And it rolls it into little balls like real quick. And it'll do like a bunch at one time so that people that like are making a lot to sell at something. You know, oh, like those um, cake pop things. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. And okay. so if you're making them just for your family, you wouldn't need this. But if you're making them to sell at an event or, you know, for a school event or something, you'd want to make a lot at one time. And it, it very quickly, you just do it back and forth a few times and it rolls them into perfect little balls. And they had it priced for um, $7. And I sold it and it even had a, a part that was missing on it. Um, I sold it for 170 plus shipping. Ah. And the, the part that was missing was like this little four pieces of plastic that kind of fit together um, to make a kind of a square or a rectangle. And you would roll your dough out in that so that it's about so thick, um, about an inch thick or something. And then like kind of a rectangle or square that you would then lift and put into the cake roller and then do the rolling part. Um, but you could do that just with a rolling pin on your counter if you didn't mm -hmm. have this little thing. And so oh, I don't know, but it. we have to have the gadget. Well, yeah, but it's, my point is it's sold even without that. And I was very clear in the listing that it didn't come with that part. And I had the buyer um, message me and say, can you still use it without that part? And I said, yes. And I sort of explained how you would do it. And she bought it. Well, then I was back in that same store like a week or so later. And what do I see for sale for 50 cents in a little Ziploc? But that piece. So okay. I bought it and I just messaged her and I said, hey, I found this thing and I'm just going to send it to you. And I didn't charge her for that. And she was just over the moon happy. And I just thought I made enough profit on that and I could probably sell it separately, but not for that much. And I thought I'm just going to do what I would hope somebody would do for me and just send it to her. And she sent me the nicest note afterwards. So uh, that I was really glad that I could sell her really the whole thing as it ended up. Well, I just looked it up online and the one I found is HCP Cake yes. Pop Easy Roller. It's That's it. Purple. That is and it. it just like, I would walk right by that. It well, just... and I did three times. <laughs> so... So that's a new one for me. Um, there's just so many gadgety things and it's for sale on Amazon for 169. Yes. And it, it's those things that I find that I'm like, what is that thing? I've never seen that before. Sometimes those things turn out to be your very best sales. That's been my experience. Yeah. And I think they must not have known what it was or what it was worth, obviously, because it was only $7. So that was but a then again. Example. Thrift stores, you know, a lot of more charity and yes. they just have to get that stuff out of there. They can't yes. price everything up and they don't have the human resources to research everything. Right. Um, I worked, well, I volunteered at a Humane Society thrift store for about a year and I was, I partnered with them and I sold their better items on eBay. and. Me, myself, one person made $11,000 wow. for that Humane Society. So when, when people ask me to volunteer, I'm like, no, I've, I've done my part. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but that was their problem is they would get entire house cleanouts. They had a couple of vans and they'd go pick things up and um, they just, they just had to get rid of stuff. Yes. And it just was heartbreaking to see like oh no you can't put a dollar on that that could sell for two hundred dollars let me take care of that for you yes. so um I did charge them a commission to do that but um and then I had to stop doing that because it was just they wanted me to keep doing more and more and more and it just became a time suck and I'm like I need to work on my own thing but right. um, 
strangely enough, I came up with a business plan for them to hire somebody that I would train to work in the store, to take pictures and put things on eBay. And I had it all worked out of how they could make $100,000 a year paying wow. somebody $8 an hour to do all this. And they would not do it. Oh my goodness. They would not hire somebody. They just wanted somebody like me to come along and make money on the commission when something sold. But you know, you're doing all this work up front that you're not getting paid for when you do right. consignment. But um, yeah. And that's when I thought, oh gosh, these these aren't business people. They're yes. they're just animal lovers, which is fine. But um I was like, oh well, I have that business plan. If anybody else is ever interested <laughs> in, you know, that was 10 years ago. So probably need to pay more now. But um, you wonder why some of these smaller stores that get these valuable items and people love their animals. And so they yes. like to donate to animal causes. Right. Um, you wonder why they don't have more of a system set up to leverage these donations because. Um, I used to shop there. That's that's how they got me on board. I was <laughs> I was shopping there to buy things to resell, and I knew what great things they would get. So anyway, not everybody has the eBay brain. <laughs> that is for sure. So that back to your sure. cake roller. Um, you know, oh, I was surprised it wasn't marked higher. Well, probably nobody had time to look it up and see what it was. Right. I, I do see there. things in that thrift store. Sometimes they'll have a sign on something that says on eBay for such and such money. And I think it's usually the listed for price, not the sold price. Yes. But I don't see that too often there. But um, that particular thrift store gets a lot of items from uh, estate sales that, you know, once they're over, I think they get a lot of things because they get a lot of one-off items there that I don't see anywhere else. That's why it's one of my favorite stores. Mm -hmm. And I, I find some of the best things at that store. So um, that's why I'm there three or four times a week usually. Okay. Yeah. So we all have our little um, honey holes as they call oh, them. Oh, yes. And I think it's, it's a matter of how often you go. Yes. Because something could be put out in the next five minutes, it's going to appear in front of you. So it's, you have to go a lot um, often to see what's newly there. And we don't mind, we don't mind treasure hunting. Oh no, it's fun. <laughs> I, it relaxes me. It's my happy place. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to it every day. I never get tired of it. Well, do you have a death pile? I do. And uh, <laughs> if I turn the camera around, you would see. But um, it's probably not as bad as, as it could be. But uh, I try to make sure it's good, really good things and not just a bunch of junk. Um, but I always think this time of year, you know, there there's winter days that come where you can't get out of the house or you don't want to get out of the house. Um, and I've got plenty to list. And um, I do have days where I just list, list, list and try and kind of clean that out. So I, I never try to let it get too big, but yeah, I do have one usually. How many items do you have listed in your store? Um, normally it's between 230, 250. It seems to stay fairly constant. Um, and that's about what I can handle. I, I don't wanna do this 40 hours a week. Um, and I'm fortunate to have a house where I can have a room with lots of storage in it for things that are, um, packed and ready to ship when they sell and mm -hmm. it's out of my office. So um, I'm living in a place where I have the room for all of that, but, um, and some of them are bulky items, uh, but I don't know, it doesn't matter how much I list or sell, that number seems to stay pretty constant. Yeah, I stay around 500. Well, now it's down to about 320 because I did offload a bunch of stuff before I moved, sure. which I'm glad I did. Yes. Um, it, it's nice to do a reset and yes, you know, kind of call out some of that dead weight 
Oh, yes. And, you know, I had something that weighed 10 pounds. I paid a dollar for it. It was for sale for a year. It was this giant, I forget the name of it. It was this giant candle holder that was this, um, it looked really cool. And, but it was glass and it was heavy. And I was like, well, it's been out there for a year. If nobody wants it, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm not dragging that with me. Yes. <laughs> you know, 10 pounds for one item or like a whole uh, Tupperware container of eyeglasses. There's like 40 pairs in there. Yes. So that was the easy stuff to move. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we have made it to the end and we are ready for the final question. Of yes. What kind of advice would you give to um, wow, other sellers, you've been doing this now almost 10 years or people who are hesitant to jump in? <laughs> I would say just jump in, just make your first listing. It's not complicated. Um, it's really step by step. The, the listing form is very easy to read and understand and follow. Uh, if you want help, you can look at on eBay for a similar item that is already sold and kind of see how they listed things. How did they word things? Your descriptions don't have to be long. It's not a big sales pitch. It's just some basic information. And um, just start with something you have around your house that you don't want anymore. And even if it never sells, you'll at least learn how to do a listing and get over the uh, newness of that and the fear of doing that. And it's really very simple. The startup costs are very, very low. When I first started, um, I, I didn't even have a scale. I didn't have a smartphone at the time. I, I didn't buy a smartphone until I earned enough selling on eBay to pay cash for one. Nice. Um, we had a very tight budget at the time. And so that's what I did. And when I got that, that made all the difference because then you can look things up in the store and probably nowadays, most people already have a smartphone. So you're going to be ahead of where I was at the time. So I would say just if, if you want to give it a try, jump in and uh, don't go spend a lot of money. Don't go buy a bunch of stuff to get started. Just start with what you have. And, um, you know, you can get free boxes at Target or the grocery store or whatever to ship something in, or you can sell little things that you can just sell in a little envelope that you buy at Target or one that comes in the mail to you, you can reuse it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get started. So just get started and try it and, and know that in the beginning, you know, you're probably not going to sell a lot and you're going to make some mistakes and you're, you're going to learn, you're going to learn. And, um, it'll just go better and better. My very first month, my profit was $75. And to me, that was enough money that is like, wow, you know, this, I didn't really work at it that hard that month because I didn't have that much to sell. And it's just, you know, the next month I made more, the next month I made more and it's turned into a very nice part-time business. So just get started. Yeah, I think if you can look at it as a perpetual garage sale. Yes. It just never ends. And so for those listening that are hesitant, um, it's a lot less work than a garage sale. <laughs> oh, yes. That's what got me started was I had been through a divorce and lost my part-time job. I was downsized out all in the same month. And I was like, I got to figure out what to do here and keep the bills paid. And I was going to have this giant garage sale. And my neighbor was like, why don't you just sell it on eBay? And I didn't know what it was. And um, so it's so much easier than a garage sale because you just do things as you feel like it, as you have time, you don't have to worry about who is going to show up. You don't have to worry about the weather. Um, and garage sales are a lot of work. And for whatever doesn't sell, you either have to donate it or drag it back in the house. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just the way I looked at it is you just 24 seven, I right. always have things for sale. <laughs> right. And I love it when I'm out for the evening and I'm making money sometimes while I'm out having dinner with a friend mm -hmm. or I'm, you know, out thrifting and while I'm out 
doing that, I'm selling a few things that I can ship, you know, for tomorrow. And it's, it's, it's fabulous. I mean, you sometimes wake up to a sale and, you know, you're making money while you're sleeping. So what could yeah. be better? We're in the same tribe. Yes. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for making the time to come on my podcast and we will look for your amazing sales on the Facebook group. It sounds good. Thank you for everything you do for us, Suzanne. We appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Always fun and such a pleasure to chat with other sellers. So thank you, Cora, for making the time to record this episode and sharing so much great information. Okay, on to today's trivia question. What was the inspiration for the Slinky? Here are five seconds to think about it. He walks downstairs alone or in pairs and makes a slinkity sound. A spring, a spring, a marvelous thing. Everyone knows it's Slinky. It gives a big... Yes, with a throwback to the old Slinky commercial. <laughs> I always wanted one for Christmas because... Um, even if I had one, it would eventually get all tangled up and just a giant mess, and so I needed a new one. <laughs> but I did love that toy. Anyway, the inspiration was mechanical engineer Richard James invented the Slinky by accident. In 1943, he was working to devise springs that could keep sensitive ship equipment steady at sea. After accidentally knocking some samples off a shelf, he watched in amazement as they gracefully walked down instead of falling. Along with his wife, Betty, James developed a plan to turn his invention into the next big novelty toy. Betty combed the dictionary for an appropriate name and came up with Slinky. James designed a machine to coil 80 feet of wire into a two-inch spiral. The couple borrowed $500 to manufacture the first Slinkies. Initial sales proved sluggish, but soared after Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia allowed demonstrations for Christmas 1945. The first 400 slinkies sold within minutes. And that part about 80 feet of wire. <laughs> yeah, give that to a six-year-old and see what happens. I bet I'm not the only one whose slinky ended up in a tangled mess after playing with it. <laughs> so a little nostalgia mixed in with trivia. All right, that is it for episode number 84. Next week, my guest is Carlos, who is from Peru. And ladies, get ready. He sounds just like Antonio Banderas. That I don't care about what the people say. I do whatever I want. So regardless of what he is talking about, you will love listening to him talk. <laughs> Thanks again for listening and make it a profitable, productive, and fun week on eBay. Bye. <laughs>